Now, I'm just going to get everyone to very quickly introduce themselves because we have some very accomplished and esteemed people here, so their bios are quite extensively long. If you want to read them, they're on the Dose the Bean page. Um, so yeah, if you just like to get one by one, introduce yourself in a concise manner, and then open up to questions. I'm, uh, I'm Steve Albert. I'm a psychologist in private practice. I do some lecturing at a couple of universities, and I'm involved in three psychedelic psychotherapy studies as uh, a therapist, two as an investigator, and I work with uh, John up the end, who's a principal investigator, and uh, Vince as well is involved in some studies. Hi, I'm Vince Polito. I'm a cognitive psychologist based at Macquarie University, and I've been developing a research program there, mainly looking at microdosing, and um, we're just about to start a clinical trial looking at low doses of psilocybin as a possible treatment for moderate depression, probably in about month and a half, two months, we'll get that underway. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Jonathan Brett. I'm a, I'm a clinical doctor, so I spend half my time at St. Vincent's, uh, mainly looking after people with sort of complex drug and alcohol mental health problems. And I'm an associate professor at uh, UNSW, University of New South Wales. And I'm a chief investigator on a couple of trials. One is using psilocybin psychotherapy for methamphetamine addiction. And the other one we're just about to start is uh, psilocybin psychotherapy for treatment-resistant depression. All right, so as, as far as I know, we have one study in Australia um, of a similar nature looking into um, end-of-life cancer, anxiety and trauma, uh, led by the wonderful Margaret Ross, St. Vincent's in Melbourne. Um, could we expect to see something similar in Sydney or um, do we know where she's up to with that? Could anyone give us an update on that for those that don't know about it? I, I know that they, uh, they had their last participant go through about two weeks ago. So that's just wrapping up actually, the one in, in Melbourne. Um, I don't know of any... How is that better? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just, uh, just saying that the um, end of life anxiety psilocybin trial in Melbourne has just finished a couple of weeks ago. They had their last participant, so there'll be results from that study pretty soon, I imagine. Um, but as for the other part of your question about something like that in Sydney, I don't know of any sort of um, end of life psychedelic studies. Do you know of anything? I mean, there's definitely interest, uh, and we're trying to build capacity. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of activity going on at St. Vincent's. Um, and so there's, there's things in the works, but uh, probably not this year, so fingers crossed in the next couple of years, though, yeah. That study by Mark Gross uh, was world uh, first for uh, end-of-life anxiety for uh, conditions beyond cancer, and it was Australia's first study uh, using psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. Uh, it's a completion of three years' worth of work, and, and uh, five years ago the planning started, so it's an important study. Yeah. Um, one thing, a small thing to pick up on is, um, I believe they use a synthetic, synthesised lab-made psilocybin, whereas um, in, this, in this video they were using whole mushrooms, um, and they, they listed the sort of secondary tertiary alkaloids in the mushrooms that might be having an effect. Um, would anyone like to, to speak to the synthetic versus natural debate that uh, seems to be a perennial one? I was just going to say that there's not really data to tell. I mean, there's a lot of people that speculate that these uh, ex extra um, components uh, make a difference, but no one's, no one's really tested it yet. Uh, it is now possible to test that. I mean, there are these companies, like we saw a couple of them in the movie there, where they are developing uh, mushroom extracts or, or mushrooms, uh, natural forms of, of psilocybin, and they're doing it now at GMP grade, which means that they, you know, could, they could be used in a trial. I think that some of these companies are now starting some trials using these mushroom ex extracts or natural mushrooms, but it's really new, and so we, we just don't know if they're, they are going to be better or different at all from synthetic psilocybin. There's one study that compared them uh, together, uh, natural versus synthetic, uh, for end-of-life anxiety, and it came out to sort of saying it had 
similar uh, beneficial effects, um, although that's just early days. And I'm curious as to whether someone's belief around the uh, potential benefits of something synthetic versus something natural would make a difference, but uh, we need a lot of research to determine that. On a practical level, <laughs> um, so far, you know, for trials, it's actually been easiest to get synthetic. Um, so that, that's predominantly the reason, really. Uh, so we did actually look into getting, from this company that was in the movie, um, into, into getting psilocybin from them. Uh, there was just concerns about shelf life. Uh, so it's basically mainly, for me, a practical concern about, you know, I don't want the medicine that we have to run out uh, because we haven't used it. Um, so, but, but I'd be interested to see studies in the future looking at that, yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's a genuine concern that it's half-life of psilocybin uh, lasting. Um, where are we going? So I guess, I guess one of the hot topics on, on everyone's mind at the moment is the recent TGA rescheduling. And everyone's hoping that that will lead to great changes in the landscape. Um, although the TGA a document itself is a little bit ambiguous on some detail. Um, could any of you guys shed some light on, on how that's going to change the landscape in Australia and how it's going to benefit people and perhaps how long that might take? Uh, maybe a bit of background. I mean, some, some, I presume most of you have heard of what's happening, but maybe sort of a bit of explanation about what it actually is. So it's been taken, it's the first country, well, the first country in the world where this has actually happened um, on this level. So it's taking um, psilocybin and MDMA from a Schedule 9, which is a, control, you know, a poison, basically, or an illicit drug, to a Schedule 8, which is a controlled prescription drug, but for very specific indications. So um, psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression and MDMA for um, PTSD. Now, um, you know, this is, there's enormous potential here um, because you know, it, it was felt by the TGA that there was sufficient evidence to support it for these indications. Um, I will say it's a pretty singular kind of event because it's never happened before in the history of Australia that you know, th this has happened without a bit more evidence. Um, so it's, it's a kind of brave new world for us. Um, I think, um, you know, on one hand, I'm excited because, you know, it's the potential to get potentially very effective medicines um, out to people. Um, on the other hand, um, I've got some reservations because, um, you know, if we don't do it carefully and study it with integrity, then there's a risk of a repeat of, you know, the, the, the 60s, 70s, where, um, you know, one or two bad events um, lead to a public turn of tide um, and has been completely set back. So I think it, the, the, it's kind of, um, we should be cautiously enthusiastic, but um, definitely urge caution because there's very little guidance as yet on how this should actually be delivered, um, you know, through this scheme. So, yeah. And not, not just in terms of a setback, but also potential harm to individuals. Uh, so the screening is super important, the protocols for screening, the protocols for preparation, the protocols for integration, which have not really been established. And uh, we're still waiting to see what will be established as a guideline and whether that will be adequate. Yeah, I guess I'd just add that the sorts of experiences that we see in this movie, I mean, this is such a lovely story of this woman's experiences and it was so positive and the movie several times talked about you know, making psilocybin accessible for everyone. And of course, you know, I think everyone would want people to have the option to have those sorts of massively important life events that really impact them in those ways. But it can be a really messy business psychedelic experiences and absolutely people can have the wonderful sorts of experiences that you see there. And that does happen often, but it's not the only thing that happens. People do sometimes have challenging experiences and uh, even experiences that end up you know, working out very well do take, you often, a lot of support and a lot of care. And so I think the sort of nervousness uh, around some of these changes with the TGA is just, do we have enough people with the skills 
that are going to be able to provide people that care in an accessible and affordable way. And it's a tricky sort of situation because, of course, we want people to have the, the opportunity, but we want to make sure that they're kept safe and that we do it well. Mm, yes, yeah, so especially given that um, when you look around the different studies around the world, there are so many different applications for this therapy from generalised anxiety, depression, PTSD. Um, what led you to, to, to study methamphetamine addiction, Jonathan? That's, I would have thought that was a curious outlying um, topic. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, it's, it's a good question. I mean, there's various levels of evidence for those indications that you've just, just mentioned. I'd say, you know, treatment-resistant depression is probably, you know, the most, it's got the most compelling evidence. But there's been a you know, number of trials in addictions as well. And, you know, I think that's something that I'm particularly interested in. Well, just because of what I see clinically every day, you know, I see people particularly coming in with um, pretty severe methamphetamine concerns. Um, you know, repeatedly. Um, so of, of, of all of the sort of drug and alcohol problems, um, you know, I think methamphetamine is one of the most difficult to treat um, and has some of the fewest treatments available. So, you know, it's, there's a real dire need for innovation. We've tried a lot of things. Um, the thing that I really like, the thing that attracted me to this, so I came from a point of view of not, like I'm a psychedelic researcher, I came from a point of view of, I'm a, I'm a drug and alcohol researcher interested in new treatments. So what attracted me to this was, in the past, um, psychotherapies and pharmacotherapies have been very siloed. So we've actually, you know, we tend to sort of investigate them separately. If we investigate a psychotherapy, um, or pharmacotherapy, a psychotherapy sort of added on as an afterthought, it feels like often. So what attracted me about this was it's actually, you know, uh, um, a real meeting of the two. Um, the focus being very much on psychotherapy, but it being sort of pharmacologically enhanced. So, um, yeah, I think I think to summarise, you know, there's a real a, a real big need um, to, for a new treatment for this particular indication, um, and you know, we, we tried many other things, but this seemed to have particular promise. And of you know, the few people we have recruited so far, like it has been fairly promising. Um, but you know, it's a all we're doing is a, a single arm study, so everyone knows they get the drug. No one's got placebo, yeah. so obviously you can't tease out the placebo effect there. Yeah, yeah. So the next, yeah, because it was the first one in the world to look at that indication. So um, the next stage would be to do placebo controlled trial. Um, but uh, yeah, we had to start somewhere. Yeah. Interesting, because given given that methamphetamine primarily is is um, dopamine stimulation and overstimulation and then you know depletion, um, and psilocybin is primarily serotonergic. Um, like you said, you chose tried many other things. I'm just curious as to is it the talk therapy that's that's really doing it and the, the openness from the psilocybin rather than any inherent physiological effect. Yeah, I, th I think there's probably two ways, to, well, many ways to come at this of understanding of what's actually going on. Um, so, and I don't think we actually know is the answer. Um, but, you know, there's, there's sort of, you can come at it from a neurobiological angle, um, or you can try and come at it from a, you know, a sort of more psychological angle. Um, and as I said, we, we don't really understand either. Um, but I think to just think about, like, dopamine system or serotonin system would be, really not fully comprehending the complexity of all of those systems and brain networks that interact together. Motivations um, and that, the, yeah, past right, right. traumas, all of it. Yeah. Exactly. So, 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 you know, on a, you know, on a higher level, what it seems to do is, um, you know, increase neuroplasticity. And so what that looks like is, um, particularly with addictions, is um, periods of, you know, being able to shift deeply held beliefs, potentially, um, and also enhance motivation. Um, put very simply, yeah. This is also an era of a coming together of um, researchers and clinicians that have been having a pharmacological approach and those that have had a psychological approach and then trying to see uh, a combination of those and which one, um, it's not clear yet as to uh, whether, whether uh, just a pharmacological approach alone, a psychedelic without the psychedelic experience that is just uh, enhancing neuroplasticity would be sufficient and depending on which in indication so we're at the beginning of all of that research yeah 
maybe it's just worth commenting just how unusual the uh, application of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is in the context of the medical system. I mean, this change that's happened with the TGA, the TGA is an organization that regulates drugs and regulates pharmacology, but really what's happening in these treatments when it works is, is very much the mix of the drug and the therapy, as Jonathan was saying. And so that's part of the kind of just overall um, novelty and newness that we're dealing with in this sort of change situation now where we've got psychedelic assisted psychotherapy now being available for some people but we don't really have um, experience in in regulating and managing those sorts of things before it's very different to any other drug treatment the the intense amount of psychotherapy that needs to go along with it mm, yeah, cause Given that we see in, in, in this example, there's there's not a lot of talk therapy going on, obviously, because it's it's a very personal, uh, introspective journey. But obviously, there's a great deal of preparation and integration that that we don't see as as much in the film. Um, sort of on a slight tangent from that. Um, I'd like to hear how your microdosing study is going, Vince. Given that, that there was a lot of sort of controversy as to whether it was placebo, whether it wasn't, and whether those small doses are having the same sort of effect. Yeah, well, we don't really have results that I can talk about yet, but I can say just a little bit the trajectory of the microdosing research. I mean, my, microdosing is really interesting because uh, it's something that's relatively new. People who microdose claim really significant benefits from it. They talk about all sorts of changes in physical health, mental health, motivation, creativity, social relationships, really wide range of things. Um, and what, you know, the, the, the kind of curious thing about people who, the, the practice of microdosing is that people claim to have these benefits without having the alterations in consciousness and the strong drug effects that are so integral in the, the high dose paradigm. And so it's really, you know, that, that's a, it's a really interesting possibility that some of those effects might occur without the alteration in consciousness. And we don't know yet, you know, from my own work, there has been other, you know, research on microdosing the last few years and results are kind of mixed. There's, there's uh, the initial sort of wave of microdosing research was all um, self-report kind of studies and surveys, questionnaires, interviews, and those studies indicate very strongly that microdosing has these beneficial effects. Those studies have been followed now by more and more lab studies, and the lab studies aren't as encouraging. They don't as clearly show benefits of microdosing. But the lab studies so far have only looked at one or a few doses. And so it's very different to what people do out in the real world. If you are talking about an antidepressant effect, it's a little bit like if you were to give someone a traditional antidepressant one dose and then say, okay, how do you feel? Are you better? You know, it's, you wouldn't really expect a change in that way. And so until we've got these kind of longitudinal studies that track people's experiences over time and studies that look really at people with um, clinical conditions as well, we, we really aren't going to know if there, there is uh, mental health benefits or physical health benefits. And so that's what we're trying to do in the trial that we're running at Macquarie is really answer some of those problems um, in, in previous designs. But yeah, I think I think that there's enough of a signal in all of the reports that people give and the, you know, some of the prospective survey studies have been reasonably well controlled and there's certainly neuroimaging evidence showing that even at low doses there are some changes in the brain. So I think it's, you know, jury's still out but I think it's certainly worth further investigation and it'll be, you know, I'm really excited to see what we find out in this trial. Yeah, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky kind of question. I mean, there's no kind of law set in stone of what we call a microdose. The convention is typically people will say that it's one-tenth or one-twentieth of a recreational dose or a clinical dose. Um, when microdosing first kind of got prominence in the media, people would often talk about these being doses that are so small that they're, they're not perceptible. And I don't think that's quite true. I don't think they're completely, you know, non -percept, non, not perceptual. I think people can notice something. It's a very different ballpark to when someone's taking these high doses and, you know, really having closed eye hallucinations and all, all of those things. But, um, yeah, the dose that we're using in our trial is going to be four milligrams of synthetic psilocybin. And so that's you know, it's a, it's certainly on the higher end of what people would consider a microdose. Some people might call that more than a microdose, even. Okay. Hi, 
Hi, uh, thanks for being here. I just wanted to ask a really fundamental question. I hear you talking about the sort of the risks and the, you know, we've got to be careful and all that sort of stuff. But then I know that drugs like Oxy, for instance, there's been so many recorded people who have had significant problems and deaths and all that sort of stuff. Has there ever been a death from psilocybin? I don't think there's ever been a sort of um, death, death from a toxic reaction to psilocybin, but you, you know there, there are risks of suicidality and suicide from psilocybin. There's never been a death in a clinical trial, but we... Um, because we know recreationally it's been happening since the 60s. I mean, yeah. it can just stop because they can be stopped doing it. Yeah. You know? Even in that video, we saw the young daughter saying she tried it recreationally. So through all of the recreational and all the rest of it, surely when someone dies, they do a test. Did they have magic mushrooms? Did they have psilocybin in them? Is there any evidence to say that anyone has died with psilocybin inside of them? Yes. <laughs> um, so, so, so the answer is yes, but did they die of psilocybin? Don't know. Um, so I'm actually just putting together some research, putting together some research, looking at um, all the calls to New South Wales Poison Centre, and I'm thinking of adding in coronial data as well, death data. But just to make your point exactly, <laughs> which is that you know, using clinical trials, we know that it's very safe. Um, from the clinical trials to date. So used in a controlled environment. Used outside a controlled environment, yes, there are more risks. And predominantly because of set and setting concerns and because of other drugs that people take with it. Um, and, and because they're not carefully selected population like Steve mentioned, yeah. So <clears throat> that, that's why we're trying to bring this into, you know, uh, uh, trying to do the hard yards of the research to prove your points. <laughs> yeah. Hello, great discussion, thank you. Uh, I have chronic pain, and I'm wondering if there's any application for um, psychedelics for the treatment of chronic pain. So there's the, there's the physical pain, and then there's the um, response, the emotional response to the pain, you know, when there's a flare up or when I'm in pain. And then there's the anxiety about the possibility of being in pain and that over time as I age. So is there any um, application for psychedelics for yeah, physical manifestations of pain and then? Um, personally, I think yes. Um, I mean, I think chronic pain is, is a, an awful thing to live with. Um, it affects every aspect of people's lives. Um, so, look, this may or may not happen, but I'm trying to set up a trial for chronic pain at St. Vincent's. Um, there is one that's hopefully going to start in Western Australia. It's not going to be much help for you, I'm afraid. Um, but there are definitely people investigating that area. Um, I think because what, what we recognise is this, there's this thing um, that, you know, it, it, this sort of strange thing where it seems to be this therapy, certainly macrodosing um, with psychotherapy, appears, appears to be effective across a number of indications. And so there's this word that people use called transdiagnostic. Um, so what we recognize is now that probably our, the way we conceptualize things like depression, anxiety, etc., maybe um, we're evolving beyond that. Um, beyond like DSM-5 criteria to understand what the commonalities are of those things. So, you know, frequently they're associated with, um, you know, social isolation, um, um, you know, kind of difficulties in um, sort of flexible thinking. Um, yeah, so, so there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of commonal commonalities to these disorders that seem to be, you know, treatable with, with uh, or at least sort of evidence to date suggests they might be treatable. So I, I would probably put chronic pain in that kind of category because I think there's, there's a lot, enough commonalities there that it's worth investigating. So. Yeah, there there's, has been one pretty well controlled lab study of microdosing showing benefits for, for chronic pain and it's certainly something that a lot of microdosers report. I think chronic pain is something that hasn't had a lot of attention from psychedelic researchers until very recently, but now there's, you know, I saw a review came out last week, there's, there's people really starting to look at this question. Thank you, that's so positive. 
Um, and in terms of ketamine, which is not a classical psychedelic, so I, I've got uh, clients that are, that are using ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, well, ketamine-assisted therapy, a pharmacological approach that have mentioned a big improvement in terms of the ability to manage chronic pain. And Marg Ross, who I mentioned, uh, did, did the study in Melbourne, mentioned that uh, uh, psilocybin enabled uh, many of her participants to have a different relationship with their body, so it's not relating to their body through chronic pain, um, perhaps even connection, connecting with a sense of uh, pleasure or, or sensuality that they haven't connected with for a long time and being able to step out of patterns of anticipating pain. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was just wondering if you think that the legalisation and regulation of psychedelic substances for medicinal purposes can and should coexist with the legalization and regulation of the same substances for recreational purposes? <laughs> well, I think that definitely decriminalization makes sense and it's absolutely important. You know, I think people have been using psychedelics for a really long time. They made the point very nicely in that, that movie that people were doing this for a really long time and then it was only 50 years ago that suddenly it was decided that this wasn't a good thing. And so, you know, they risky substances but lots of things have risks and also have benefits and so yeah I think that people have used psychedelics for ages will continue to use psychedelics uh, outside of the medical system even now I do think there's a real difference in sort of the responsibility that society has to people taking psychedelics in different contexts like if someone of their own free choice wants to experiment with their consciousness and and take psychedelics then I think absolutely they should be able to do that that's a very different situation to someone who's coming to a medical professional and wanting to take psychedelics you know for wellness or for treatment and I think in that medical situation we've got uh, a, a much greater kind of duty of care and to, to make sure that people are looked after better. So I think they're quite, I think there's really important differences between them. Um, I suppose my, uh, my answer is slightly different. Um, so in order to get a drug um, approved by the Therapeutic Drugs Administration and then paid for by the PBS, you have to have a certain level of evidence. So you have to have done a certain amount of research on the drug. So uh, like I am for decriminalization of all drugs <laughs> as a drug and alcohol specialist. Um, but another part of me is like, well, I'm a bit concerned that if we do that, um, will, will the environment allow us to then keep doing the trials, placebo controlled trials that we need to do to actually gain the evidence to get it through that process so it is actually available to everyone so that people don't have to pay $20,000 to have this kind of treatment. That's why yeah. I do you think they can coexist? So if we take cannabis as an example, um, so you know, cannabis was decriminalized, it's now um, out there, you know, anyone can use it. Will it ever get to a point where it's TJ registered and PB, PBS subsidized? No, I don't think so now. Um, because we, the, the the number of clinical trials and the ability to do clinical trials is rapidly diminished, that, and that's the cost of that, right? So if, if we want actually good evidence that these things work and we want them to be widely available to everyone, not just rich people, um, you know, we, we have to do the research. Yeah. Yeah, um, I just I just like to add to that. I mean. The, the comment that these things have been used for, you know, tens of thousands of years compared to this 50, 60 years of war on drugs um, kind of highlights that there's always been a cultural context for the use of these things. They've always been held in a, in a very sacred, uh, ritualised cultural container. And I think if they were to coexist in, in any form, we would need to develop new cultural models in which there were, say, like there's in America, there's churches, you know, setting themselves up as legitimate religious organizations with psychedelics as their sacrament because it's just the way their, their law is structured. And so there's, there are places people can go and have these experiences in, in safe, supervised settings with experienced people and, and Personally, I think that's a, a really good model. It could exist side by side with clinical trials. 
yeah, I mean, the, the sort of, um, the aspect of psychedelics where people have these profoundly meaningful personal experiences is another complicated part of this puzzle. I mean, we don't have the cultural experience and the cultural container for those sorts of things. So oftentimes people going through clinical trials will have these highly profound experiences and it can be tricky sometimes for people to make sense of that. And so, you know, part of what I think needs to happen for psychedelics to be something that really is widely available is for us to be able to be comfortable with those sorts of experiences and direct people into ways of sort of using that that have some meaning for them. So there have been some uh, really interesting studies out of John Hopkins, which is an institution that's, that's very focused on this kind of, um, you know, intense personal meaning aspect of the psychedelic experience, where they found that people who have some kind of spiritual practice or something like that seem to do much better with psychedelic experiences compared to people who don't have that pre-existing kind of practice or, or um, orientation. And so, yeah, I think that's good evidence that w we need some ways of helping people make sense of what happens on psychedelics that aren't just medical. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, so you mentioned about skills, and exactly to that point, um, if someone wanted to do a career change, I'm assuming all those through, what sort of skills are you going to get? How can one get to the point where you're going to see it on the screen? The, uh, the TGAs uh, said that um, psilocybin and MDMA will be prescribable from July the 1st, but it's not just a substance, it's a package of um, uh, therapeutic help. They haven't specified what the qualifications for the therapist need to be or the training. The psychiatrists need to have some extra training to be able to prescribe it, to be authorised prescribers, but they haven't specified yet what the therapists uh, need to be. Do they need to be psychologists or clinical psychologists or, or counsellors or interested and passionate? Who knows, right? So, yes. Or more importantly, experienced. I mean, I don't think you can guide someone through a bad psychedelic trip unless you've been there yourself. It's just such a profoundly unique experience that, yeah, it's like, you know, trying to relate to someone that's that's going through death, unless, you know, you've been there, yeah. The, there's um, a program that's been set up through Monash University to be training people in psychedelic psychotherapy, uh, which is starting up, and one of the key requirements is someone with therapeutic experience working with PTSD, because you don't know what's going to come up, mm -hmm. and to be able to sort of be a hold your metal when everything's falling apart with someone as a therapist is super important. I'd say it's a bit of a moving target as well. So at the moment, people are being super cautious. So it's a, you know, generally trials are, you know, the therapists are either psychiatrists or clinical psychologists. But like with all these things, as we learn more, um, you know, we might think, we might find actually that, you know, it's, it, it's okay in a clinical setting to not have those qualifications and you know to have different qualifications so i think that you know the work will be done i think like ultimately we probably need to find a more cost effective way of doing it because you know you, you need to have a, two therapists at the moment with you uh, most of the time particularly through the the dosing day which for psilocybin can be you know eight hours so you know the question is how cost effective is that if you've got like a psychiatrist and a clinical psychologist probably not um, so, you know, it's early days and I think it's a moving target. So I would watch this space before you do any major career changes. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? Or? Um, I just have a question about music. Uh, it's quite clear from the experience that a musical playlist throughout this experience really shaped the journey and the tone. Um, what role do you think? music plays, I and mean, given the science around the cymatics and you know, more research coming out, is there a future for you know, music therapy assisted tr trips in a more um, interactive way than just putting on a, a, a mask? Um, and yeah, why do you think music, what about music makes it so powerful and significant in these experiences? 
Ooh, that's a, that's such a good question. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, typically, uh, often there's a dyad, two therapists in that, and they call music the third therapist. And there's different uh, ways of putting together the music. Uh, and it might be uh, a whole straight series of sort of calming kind of music. Some kinds of playlists are, are trying to um, uh, match the uh, ascent and plateauing and descent, uh, but that varies uh, according to individual. There's companies out there that are creating um, variable playlists that can sort of, ch as you're watching what's going on with someone, you can change the music that's being played according to where they're at. Yeah, um, so, you know, Marg Ross actually, she's um, working in, in um, Melbourne with a musicologist to answer these questions. Yeah. You know, I mean, even without psychedelics, the music is, can be very, very emotive. Um, I think it's, like, it's key to the, you know, some of the experiences that people have in terms of sort of um, yeah, helping them access and unlock that. Um, because, it, you know, a lot of it's very emotionally charged. Um, so, you know, a lot of the, you know, the therapy, I don't know whether people have realized, but like in psilocybin psychotherapy, we don't really encourage much talking. We just, it's, it's very non-directive. Um, so they generally just lie there with an eye mask on. Um, so it's really the music that's sort of um, taking them deeper and into that. And actually in, in ritualistic sort of shamanistic practices as well with ayahuasca, very much music guided so there's periods of music and there's periods of silence and you know it really um, it really helps enhance things I think we're only just beginning to understand how to use that to its full potential um, but it's a really good question um, and yeah I think it's, it's going to be really powerful to invest it the, the problem with well, one of the challenges with this area is there's so many moving parts um, so there's the therapy there's the, the, the medicine, whatever you decide to give, um, and then there's all the permutations of that, then there's the music, then there's the environment, and you know, is it best in a forest with bird sounds? Is it best in a hospital bed? You know, so there's, there's, it, it doesn't lend itself to traditional empirical research where you fix everything and change one thing. Um, so it's, it's really interesting for me anyway, designing trials around this, yeah. Yeah, I think with some of these, uh, environmental factors that's maybe not even ever going to be a best way of doing it. I think there's just probably lots of different ways that people can have psychedelic experiences or altered state experiences and there's lots of you know history of the way these things have been done before that points to music being really important and I think really exciting possibilities for what that might look like in the future. So to kind of answer your question I'd say absolutely there's a role for music specialists in psychedelic spaces. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I think music therapy has two courses in Australia and about 700 therapists kind of nationally. So it'd be interesting to see what studies come up in the future when there's like a collaboration between therapists and, and people like you. So thanks. There is quite a few papers on music and psychedelic therapy, if you're curious about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely like a stream of research that's already underway. Yeah. And if you know any, I'm very like, please tell them to reach out. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I think even having these um, experiences outside in, in natural settings, natural undisturbed settings, um, you know, going to be a fine day. Um, yeah, a nature immersion combined with psychedelics. I'm just imagining trying to get that through the ethics committee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a few more. Yeah, what's the thing, is it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll take maybe one more question because I think we're probably getting close to the end of time. Uh, I think you're turning up first. Yeah, I'm just on the uh, just tag on to the last question. Um, the other night I watched a live inside of documentary about the Nazi patriotism music and how they were actually you know, brought back. And I was just wondering, is there a uh, any further research or you know, whether music on psilocybin or psychedelics um, is improving dementia or Alzheimer's patients' lives? I, I don't know of any studies that have been done like that, but I, I would be sure that that is something that will be looked into. I mean, people are certainly starting to think about psychedelics and cognitive decline broadly and so it seems like a, a really interesting one that is worthy of investigation. Yeah, sorry I don't have any more specific info. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not actually aware of any trials, like I could be wrong, there's a lot of like new trials being registered but I'm not currently aware of any trials looking specifically at dementia. 
Um, yeah. yeah, I think you'll find a lot of, um, if you Google you know, um, Alzheimer's and psychedelics, you, you may find a lot of anecdotal evidence of people microdosing and, and claiming you know, neuroregenerative effects. Definitely seen you know, some substantial writings out there, whether they be peer reviewed or not, I'm not sure. Um, well, what, what, what have we got coming up in the future, guys? Well, um, I'm hoping um, that we can just increase capacity in sort of New South Wales, really, to do that. I mean, it's, it's so lovely working with these guys. They're like, it's a very small world, um, and uh, we all sort of know each other. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly on a, a sort of a smaller scale at St. Vincent's, We've got two trials. Like I'm hoping we can start some more. Um, you know, it's getting to the stage now where you know we'll probably have to start working with pharmaceutical companies um, to you know work towards getting drugs. Um, you know, doing the trials that would actually lead towards registration. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, we're still applying for grants and you know, getting sort of looking for money for from philanthropy to uh, to fund the trials. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, for me, we're just we're wrapping up a brain imaging study of microdosing. We've just got the last few participants that we'll, we'll do in the next month or so, and then starting this clinical trial that I already mentioned. Um, I'll also do a quick plug. I've, uh, a couple of students of mine are, are just starting a um, what I think is going to be a really interesting project where we're going to um, uh, track people's experiences before and after a psychedelic um, T taking a psychedelic, we're not going to provide the substance, but just do a bunch of measures before and afterwards. And we're really going to try and compare experiences of people who are taking psychedelics in the context of uh, underground therapy, clinical trials, at a party or at a ritual, looking at the differences across these. So, um, yeah, uh, a couple of my students, Sage and Charles, are at the back with flyers. So if you think you might be having a psychedelic experience in the next six months, please grab a flyer and <laughs> tell us about it. That would be great. <laughs> Yeah, so the, just for everyone, um, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it, yeah, so um, the question is, you know, are there any studies coming up to treat people with cluster B personality disorder, which is otherwise known as borderline personality disorder, yeah. Um, so actually, historically, that's been an exclusion of most trials. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why, um, but I mean, I, I, and I'm not sure actually of any registered studies for that, but you know, I'm, I'm not across this rapidly evolving space. So if you are interested in finding out whether there are any studies on something, I'd recommend you go to ANZCT, Australian New Zealand Clinical Trial Register, or um, clinicaltrials.gov, which is the US version. And there you can basically search for all the trials that are on everything <laughs> that's currently registered, yeah. Just on that note, at the, on the Australian Psychedelic Society webpage, there's a psychedelic clinical trial finder that you can go to the website and it's pretty, pretty easy to find and you can register in there for the upcoming trials. Can I just ask, I've heard that uh, psychedelics have powerful anti-inflammatory properties. Are they, is there any research into their use to treat autoimmune diseases? Um, no. <laughs> so so we, we're doing some um, biomarker studies, but that's for neuroinflammation, not for you know, systemic inflammation. So I, I can't quite see the kind of the rationale for that. I mean, it's, it's mainly for brain disorders. Um, and in the brain, I use that term very reductively it's for like, you know, everything, brain psychology, society, etc. But I've not really heard of it for systemic inflammatory disorders. But, you know, I'm so happy. it might be the stress. Uh, oh, sure. The ongoing stress that sure. causes the autoimmune yeah. conditions. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, look, <laughs> it seems like if you can find a disorder, they're trying to, to treat it with psychedelics at the moment. So, um, <laughs> quite, quite possibly. But I think we've got to, like, my, my kind of thinking is go for the low-hanging fruit to begin with. <laughs> 
do the simple things first, and then you know we can sort of go from there. So yeah. Okay, one last question. I think we had someone up the back that's been waiting quite a long time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. How do you go about finding a therapist who works with psychedelics? Uh, the golden question. <laughs> I mean, up until now, it hasn't been legal, so it hasn't been something that you know is possible for someone to do above board. Um, now that there is this change, psychiatrists can apply to be authorised prescribers and, and deliver these therapies, but it's probably going to be a little while for that to ramp up. I mean, it's something that you can now talk to your psychiatrist about and they may be able to refer you to either, you know, provide the therapy themselves if they're an authorised prescriber or refer you to someone who might be able to. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we're going to see we're going to see options for this in the next year. It's pretty, pretty exciting time, actually. Yeah. So, just just to add to that, I think it is an exciting time, and I think um, you know it's it's great that this is happening in some ways. I think that there always will be an underground market while there is, while the treatments remain extremely expensive, um, which is seems to be the way things are probably going. Yeah, and some people so. prefer all the shamanic bells and whistles and, and various different styles of, of you know, set and setting. That's right. I mean, I, I would encourage you to listen to Cover Story, the podcast, if you haven't. Uh, yes. Um, it kind of goes through um, some of the risks with underground um, use, um, which is, you know, you're in a very vulnerable position with someone you don't really know very well who isn't necessarily had their credential validated. Um, so, you know, it, it comes with inherent risk as well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's, there's quite a few groups emerging now, Patch being one of them, that, that are really trying to sort of help people navigate that territory of underground facilitators and red flags to watch out for. So I think we need to wrap it up here. So please give a wonderful thanks to our three guests.